Stand up with the fear of God, let us hear the Holy Gospel, a chapter from the Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, may his blessing. And he 
he arose and came to his father. But when he has, he was still a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and gave him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals <coughs> on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked about these things, man. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has he has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years, I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time, and yet you would never give me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with our lots, you kill the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive, and was lost and is found. Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. We're in the third week of Lent, and the Gospel of today is the prodigal son. Just to review again the weeks of Lent and their themes, we have seven weeks, um, and that um, we can divide them into twos and leave the last one for Palm Sunday. The first two we just finished last two weeks is the, the kingdom of God. And Jesus actually advised us to say, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the second one is the temptation. And we remember always when you are seeking the kingdom of God, you're always going to be tempted. That's, the, that's a fact. You start to pray and you say, I'm, go I'm going to start in my mind and my heart. I have a firm resolution to pray. 
And the minute you start doing your things, you get tempted. You get tempted harshly. And you say, and people come to confess and say, Abuna, whenever I want to come closer to God, there is always something bad happens that pushes me away. What the Gospel and the New Testament and even the Old Testament tells us, if you stand your ground, whatever you gained, you will keep. But you have to stand your ground. St. Paul advises and St. James, St. Peter, they all said, resist the devil. Don't let him take over what you already decided to do. It's always the case. So Christ goes out to the wilderness to fast. The devil comes to tempt him. So whenever you are in, interested in the kingdom of God, there will be a temptation. You just have to stand where you are and keep your grounds. So the first is kingdom, second is temptation. Then the second, two weeks, the second couple is the boy and the girl. And the boy is the prodigal son that we read today. And the girl is next week a Samaritan woman. The third couple of weeks is the lame and the blind to sick people. And the lame by the pool of Bethesda, um, Bethesda, I'm sorry, Bethesda, and the, the blind, the man born blind in the week, in the last week of Lent. And then we go to Palm Sunday. And the sequence is actually, some, some fathers commented on it and said, the sequence has a, has a meaning. Whenever we come to seek the kingdom, we get tempted. And then if we fail in the temptation, we enter into sin. And there's a stage for repentance, the coming back. The boy and the, the girl are actually a stories of coming back. The prodigal son and the Samaritan woman, both of them returned. But then if the return doesn't happen, we go into sickness. When the soul gets sick and even the body, that is the man, born, the man by the pool. And then we don't forget that we are all born with infirmity. It is Jesus who opens our eyes and give us light and give us life. So, uh, and then and eventually it ends up by the glorious entry into the kingdom of Christ, Osanna in the highest, the king of Israel, Osanna, the one that comes from the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So uh, this is the story on the journey of Lent. Today we, we take the gospel of the prodigal son. A prodigal son, St. John Christophe says, if the gospel is only the prodigal son, would have been enough to convey God's good news. This is the gospel. You can take it as a story, even if it is not from the gospel. It is from the gospel. You can take it as a good story, beautiful story. It's a relationship-based story, a story, a love story, a father and two sons. And that seems like a rich father who has a very big house, and he has servants, and has tables, and have uh, wardrobes where they keep good clothing, and uh, like uh, cases for jewelry and rings and good stuff. And he has um, a lot of servants. And in this house he has two sons. And there's no mentioning of a mother. Actually, the, the father here, they say, um, I, I heard this, talk about Rembrandt the painting of the prodigal son. He says, he painted him as a father and a mother at the same time. You see this tender, compassionate heart of a mother and the father. But the two sons, um, one of them, the younger one, said to his father, give me my portion of goods that belongs to me, which he means, what does he mean by that? And when you die, we're going to divide our, your inheritance, whatever you're going to leave. But I want it now. It's very hard, hurtful, really very hurtful. The amazing thing, the amazing thing that actually kind of gets me every time that the father says nothing. If I put myself in that father's shoes, I'll be very angry. I'll be furious. You can't wait even if I die, until I die to get my, my inheritance. You want it now? So the father did, which is amazing. The father actually listened to the son and said, okay, you want it? Here it is. So he divided the, the, the livelihood, divided his money, and gave his younger son his portion. And the, fa the son maybe put it in a bag or something, waited not many days. And a few days later, he gathered this bag, gathered himself, and left to a far country. And why a far country? He doesn't want any, any control from his father. He doesn't want his father to know anything about what he's doing. 
He wants to get as far as he can from his father. And there he actually did all what he was dreaming of. So apparently he was dreaming of doing things and the father was in his way. So he went very far away and did exactly the dreams of his youth. Everything he had thought about. And then when he spent all his money, he was very busy spending the money for his bad luck. A famine arose in the country where he was. What's a famine? Things getting, get to be very pricey. Basic food items becomes very expensive. There is not enough resources. And with that comes lack of jobs. There's no jobs. So he started to be in need. And the need went all the way for him, not just being homeless, to be hungered and no one can give him food because there is nothing. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And here is something interesting. A citizen of that country, something, somebody who belongs to that far country, doesn't belong to the country of his father. And he sent him to the swine, to the hog confinement. Hog confinements. Any one of us here had, had the pleasure of visiting one? You you visited it? Perfect. It's, it is very difficult. I, I lived in Iowa for a little bit and there is plenty of those hot confinements. There's plenty of them. You just have to drive next to one, you understand what I'm going to be talking about. It's awful. So he, he, he stayed there apparently without money. He didn't give him money ahead. He just left him there and the, the, the boy was working with the, with the hogs, feeding them, cleaning their place. Hogs are never clean. You clean them, they come back and make it worse. One thing about uh, pigs, they eat where they poop. They don't have any idea about cleanness. This is the worst animal when it comes to hygiene. The worst. And that's why one of the reasons why the Jews don't really like it at all. When Jesus said this to the Pharisees, they were appalled. They were shocked. Goes to serve pegs? This is crazy. What would happen from the mind of a Jew that this boy entering that place becomes very defiled, very unholy. He cannot touch anything holy. He cannot come to the temple. He cannot pray. He cannot stand before God in prayer. He becomes very dirty. Let alone that he already had been joining foreigners, Gentiles, from the Pharisee. If a Pharisee listened to this parable, they would be like, what? What in the world? He actually threw away everything. But then something happened. He was sitting there watching pigs eat the food that he poured in their place, the same place they go to toilet for. And you know, pigs when they eat, they make noise. A lot of noise. It's really disgusting. So he looked at them, and what happened? This is what Jesus is saying. He said, and he would gladly have filled his stomachs with the pods that the swine ate. Wow. You know, you're looking at something that's very disgusting, and yet that boy was desiring that food. What, how do you explain that? How would you explain it? What's the explanation? But, which even adds to the, the insult to the injury, no one would give him any of it. So, he made a discovery. And this was an was a experiment for him. He made a great discovery. What's the discovery? Wow, he is hungry. Why is it a discovery? When we are hungry, we know we're hungry. Except, you know when we don't know we're hungry? If we're very busy doing something. Very busy to the degree that we forget that we need to eat. And all of a sudden, a person busy doing something and they're excited about doing it, all of a sudden wake up and say, why am I doing this? Why am I craving this evil stuff? Why am I so interested in something that should not be interested in? I'll explain to you what that is for us. When you and I start looking at pornography, craving stuff that people do outside the church, 
and they are interested in it and they do it with a noise and we think wow that seems that looks very good or we're interested in a fame or a degree or anything we crave it so much to the degree that we lose our identity so when this happened this is a good one that's a good son why because when he started looking at the pigs and be interested in these disgusting food he said to himself what's happening to me this is the blessed verse verse number 17 don't forget the number the chapter is 15 the verse is 17 he says but when he came to himself that almost like a slap on his face he said I am desiring pigs food how is that why is that yeah I guess I am hungry he came to himself when he found that he was desiring the wrong things and he said, how many of my, of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Not only hungry, he is perishing, he's dying with hunger. He's famished. And then he made a very blessed decision. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. <clears throat> In the midst of our busyness, trying to conquer the world, trying to get things that we think is important, we lose touch with ourselves. We lose touch with ourselves. That happens all the time. We get so busy with something, with money, with a degree, with a friendship, with something, and all of a sudden, we are actually unaware of what's going on with our hearts. And then desires start to arise. Desires that's only belonging to people that does not belong to God. Horrible stuff. But a human being who is blessed and holy will arise and be waken up by these desires and not let it take over. So he said, I'm going to go to back my to my father and I'm going to say something. It's not really good. I go back now because what am I going to say to my father? He has all the right to hate me. He has all the right to be angry with me. I know I cannot go like this and show myself to him and be okay. I cannot imagine that happen. So what should I do? He said, let me prepare something. Let me prepare a few words. Tell him something that maybe he will accept me when I say this. So he prepared words. I love this because Jeremiah says, let us examine our ways. Let us take words and go back to God. God is a kind God, a kind Father. He appreciates our words if it's coming from our hearts. We prepare it and we take it with us as a gift, as a sacrifice, a sacrifice of prayer. And I offer it to God and say to Him, this is what I have. I really don't have anything. You give me everything and I wasted everything. Now I have my heart and my words. So He said, let me tell him that I really, I'm really sorry. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I don't consider myself your son because what I have done is not, a, not an act of a son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Accept me as a worker. It's much better than working with swine. So he arose and came to his father. He was still a great way off. And his father saw him. He was very far away. And the father saw him. That means something. That means the father was watching and waiting for him every day. So the father actually saw him coming and had compassion. His heart moved. And then ran the father, a dignified father, a rich man who has servants and a big house, ran, running. And, and everybody saw him running and fell on his neck, he took him in his bosom and kissed him. Okay, wait a second here. I mean, I'm talking about Jewish community listening to this parable. A person coming from pigs, not only that he stinks, he is defiled. He's unclean. Why would the father do this? This is a shock that the father would take this man in his bosom. He's actually as defiled as the pigs. No, no Jew in their right mind will hug a pig. Will, will, will hug a big or take him in their bosom. So he started to talk and he said, 
father, I can imagine the, the son is in the bosom of the father, and the father is kissing him, and the son is talking at the same time, and he said, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The last piece, which was, make me as one of your hired servants, was not said. The son could not say it. The father interrupted and said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. What's he doing? He's covering him, because he comes in a very miserable status. He's going to cover him, and very quickly reinstating him to his first place. Then here I say, um, they take him to the house and they do that, and they make a party. Let me just say this, there are three steps in this story. I want to just, just give a little analysis, bear with me. There is three steps of return, it's not one. If I wrote this, if I wrote this parable, I would have finished here. These extra steps about the rope and the ring and the servants, it's unnecessary if I'm going to be the one to write it. But why is Jesus doing it? There's nothing unnecessary in the words of Christ. It seems like there are three returns, or three stages of returns. The first return is to Think about it. himself. Because the first one, he was lost from his own self. That's the worst thing. The person gets lost from their own mind and heart. They don't know what's going on with them. I see this all the time when people come to confession. They're lost. They, they, they are lost. They're looking for something, and they're in, their, in their quest for that something, they lose sight of their own self, heart and mind. He did that. And the second step, he made a decision to come to his father, to God. And the second step was returned to God, the Father. What's the third return, the third step? Coming to the house. Coming to the house. That coming to the house was essential. Because this is where he's going to be covered. This is where we, he's going to be fed as a hungry person. This is where he's going to be served. And notice, again, another extra detail that I think is extra that Jesus is putting there. If I'm the father and my son has been lost, would I leave him to anybody? I'm not going to let him go for a whole day. I'm going to stay with him and not let him sleep, let him tell me everything. I would get, give him enough hugs and kisses until I get done, because I'm not done yet. But what happens here is the father turns to the servants. Who are the servants? Okay, wait a second. What's the house? It's not heaven. You know, Jesus is not saying when somebody comes to God, they go to heaven. So what's the house of God? It is the church. And who are the servants? Who has the keys? Whom Jesus said, to you I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Who are the servants? In the mind of Christ. I'm talking, look at the story from the point of a story. Forget it's the gospel. Who has the keys to open and bring out the ropes and bring out the sandals and bring out the padded cap? Who will feed and clothe? The priest. So he is, in Jesus' mind, he knows how the steps of return will happen. A person has to come to, him, to himself. In their own day, they might be at work. You might be at work, you might be in school, you might be in the way, driving somewhere, or riding a bus. And all of a sudden, it dawns on you. He said, what, wait a second, where am I? What's happening to me? What am I so busy about? And then, once you come to yourself, you say, oh, I miss. I miss being fed, I miss being covered, I miss being closer to God. Let me go to him, and the father will tell you something. Isaac the Syrian said it's very beautiful, and Pope Carolus used to say it all the time. Everybody who thinks that he's repenting and going back to God and not praying is deceived. If we don't have a prayer life and we think we're close to God, we are deceived. So the man, the son, has to prepare words and go back to his father and speak to his father face to face. This is at the bedroom, at your bedroom, not when you come to confess. But then after you finish your prayer at the bedroom, you come to the church and you sit with the priest and tell them, here I am, this is what happened. And the priest would read you absolution and forgive the sins through the power that Jesus gave to the apostles. Whoever you forgive, they'll be forgiven. And then when that is given to me, I am covered, I am dressed. Because notice he's going to sit at a table and eat with guests 
honorable guests in a big house. It's one of those abbeys, those mansions, where you go there, you have to go with a proper clothing. You can't really sit at a big table with dignitaries, people who are of, of high status, and you're sitting there in rags coming from pigs' tie. It's unheard of. So when you come to eat from the table of the king, you have to be covered. And how are we covered? By is the absolution given to us in confession. When the priest says, your sins are forgiven, go in peace. <clears throat> and then, all sanctity and holiness is imparted in him. This is all acts of sanctification. The clothing, the ring, the sandals, and the fatted calf. It's all sanctifying. And I notice it's from top to bottom. You got the, the covering. You got the ring. You got the, for your feet a shoe. And you, inside also, I got the food to be fed so I'm not hungry anymore. He could have gone to the kitchen and give him something. No. That's another detail. Why can't he tell the cook, prepare something quick, the boy is famished? No. He had to make it a party. It had to be celebrated. It had to be celebrated. The last detail that I always figure, you know, comment on, as a person who has experienced the smell of pegs, I think the one detail that is missing here, that is very important, that I cannot let this story go without thinking about it. What is the most important step that Jesus omitted from this story? There is a very important step here. He gave him a clothing, he gave him the ring, he gave him the sandals, he gave him the fatted calf. Hmm? Washing shower. A shower? Excuse me. <laughs> he had to be showered with very good soap. And a lot of showers, not one. Because that smell would not go by one. They would have to do something very powerful. And why did Jesus actually omit that one? Oh, that's very obvious. I mean, from Jewish point of view, if you want to clean somebody and bring them back to purity, what should you do? Wash them. Wash them. And they would stay unclean for a whole day after the wash. But why is this important Jewish detail is omitted from the parable? I demand an answer. What is showering in the house of God? Baptism. Baptism. And that makes a person a son and a daughter. But if he is a son, he is already showered. He cannot be showered again. It's only once. It cannot be repeated. So Jesus is telling us a vivid image of what a return of any person to God will be. Those three steps. Come back to yourself by self-examination. Ask yourself, how do you feel? What are we? What are we doing? Second, prepare yourself for a prayer when you get done with it. And go to God in your bedroom and ask forgiveness. And the third, come to the church and receive the covering, the clothing, ring, sandals. It's all status. That's the sanctifying tools. Remember, it's also a story from a Jewish point of view. It's a story of defilement and sanctification. Defilement by going to the pigs ends up with the pigs and sanctification by coming to the church. That's why I want to end with this little addition. It is definitely repentance, that's the return. Return is repentance. Repentance, metania, is the turning back, is making a U turn. But the sanctification part, when we, when we fill our hearts and minds by words and visions and voices, of the world, it defile us. We become lost. But to be sanctified is to be covered and filled by the words of God and by his food and to become holy again. And Jesus in this parable says, there is nothing to prevent you from that. Nothing. Actually, God the Father is waiting for us. He's not going to ask, ask for any conditions. He doesn't ask his son for nothing. He says, just come back. Just come back, I'm waiting for you. And that is the message of the prodigal son today. Come to be sanctified, come to be holy, come back to my bosom, come back to my house. We give him glory for his complete, complete mercy and his perfect kindness and gentleness with us. To him is the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.